Welcome. Welcome, everybody. Good morning. Thank you for being here. It's so wonderful to be together. If you would like, you can turn on gallery view and you can see everyone that is here in our virtual sanctuary. Everyone's waving hi. It's so good to see each other and to make connections however we can. If this is the first time here or you're not yet connected to us or you don't get our newsletter, watch for a chat coming from Dawn's student who has welcome in front of her name or send her a private chat and she'll be happy to get you connected. A reminder that details for all of our programs can be found in our e-bulletin, our weekly email newsletter. So I invite you now to take a breath, to enter into this space, this sanctuary, this time that we create together. And of course, as we would if we were in person, we leave the door open to allow others to come inside. Good morning. We should take a moment to acknowledge the land on which we are gathered for this service. For thousands of years, this land has been the home of the Patwin people, including the Yochadihi Winton Nation today. The Patwin people have remained committed to the stewardship of this land over many centuries. It has been cherished and protected as elders have instructed the young through generations. We are honored and grateful to be here today on their traditional lands. This was approved by Yochadihi Tribal Council on May 14th, 2019. I invite you to light your chalice as I light mine. Raise your chalice towards the camera so we can shine our light together. The chalice lighting is adapted from Melanie Morrill Ensminger. Come, come, whoever you are, you are welcome here. No matter your age, your size, the color of your eyes, your hair, your skin, you are welcome here. No matter how you came to this space, if you are alone or if others are watching this service with you, welcome in. No matter whom you love or how you speak or whatever your abilities, whether you come with laughter in your heart or tears in your eyes, you are welcome here. If you come here with an open mind, a loving heart and willing hands, then indeed you are welcome here. Come, let us worship together. Every week we take time in this service to find a different perspective and to practice gratitude. Over time, may gratefulness and a new attentiveness become a spiritual practice for life. Gratitude for the beauty that surrounds us here in the Central Valley. Even in the worst of the summer heat, it is there waiting to be noticed. From a delicate sprig of Mexican sage to the comforting hum of sprinklers running in the early morning, to the fruit trees ripening in the sun, it is there. To the lofty shade trees and pines that grace our church grounds or our homes. It is there for the noticing, for the lifting of our spirits, for replenishing our souls. We are grateful for beauty.
Unitarian Universalists celebrate the diverse belief and experiences of the people in our congregations. Sometimes I hear people say, well, we all have different beliefs or we can all believe whatever we want. That's not quite right. We have a long and rich history of theology and defining as a faith how you use make meaning in the world. Theology is the study of religion or the study of God. Theos is the Greek word for God. Every religion is grounded in a theology with scholars and spiritual leaders who look at the core beliefs and practices of a religion and interpret them for modern times. UUism is no exception. The most prominent 20th century UU theologian was James Luther Adams. He was born in 1901 and died in 1994. He was a parish minister, social activist, a writer and editor, and for more than 40 years, a professor, first at Meadville Lombard Theological School and then Harvard Divinity School, inspiring generations of UU ministers. The UU Historical Society calls Adams the most influential theologian among 20th century Unitarian Universalists and one of the finest 20th century American liberal Christian theologians. He was commonly known by his initials JLA. That's how he signed his books. In 1976, he published an essay, Guiding the Principles for a Free Faith where he explains the five smooth stones of liberal religion. These are religious liberalism depends on the principle that revelation is continuous. All relations between persons ought ideally to rest on mutual free consent and not on coercion. Religious liberalism affirms the moral obligation to direct one's effort toward the establishment of a just and loving community. We deny the immaculate conception of virtue and affirm the necessity of social incarnation. Liberalism holds that the resources divine and human that are available for the achievement of meaningful change justify an attitude of ultimate optimism. In 2012, a group of ministers took a poetic look at interpreting these statements and Sarah Larkin is going to share their writing which they originally set to the tune of Leonard Cohen's Alleluia. The king declared the book was sealed. Three gods were one, all truths revealed. But truth that's stale and dusty doesn't move you. Your own life shows that there is more, other truths that shake your core a spirit that's a living hallelujah. Calvinists claimed the threat of hell. They made strict laws, used fear as well. But you don't need a threat to be good, do you? You know that love has its own reward, whether humanist from goddess or Lord, invited to sing a loving hallelujah. The gods of old were in control. Miracles and judgment were their role. Prayers to those gods didn't make sense to you. The universe had other plans. The work of God was in your hands. A call to a daring hallelujah. The sin of Eve and Adam weighed on human souls. Their bed was made. The wisdom in this story always threw you. You know that virtue needs our aid to choose justice. We must persuade our siblings to a righteous hallelujah. 
From dawn of time, doom oft prevailed. The end is near, the masses wailed. War and greed will be the death knell to you. As creatures of spirit, we must respond. Our covenants provide our bond. We sing out a determined hallelujah. In preparing for today's service, Reverend Morgan asked me, so why do you volunteer with the Children's Foundation in Myanmar? I blink. She continues, is there a part of my faith that grounds me or pulls me to that work? Well, yes, there probably is, but I would need to dig for it, uncover it and bring it out under the broad daylight for inspection. It's most likely a core part of my inner compass, lying underneath the soil after years of composted input from various spiritual excursions broken hearts, and family nurturing. Looking back to 2007, the first reason I got involved in Myanmar was my son Max. As author Stephen Covey said, be interested in what your kids are interested in. That was kind of my mantra. It was my mom's too. It was hardwired into our genetics. Max had been teaching in Myanmar the year just after his college graduation. When he returned home on break, he asked me, how can I raise $10,000 to build a school building for kids in rural Myanmar? $10,000, I said. Gulp. Yeah, he said, $10,000 will build a small school compound with classrooms and a teacher's hut. I came across a school half finished and the community needs help to finish it. I responded, well, how much time do you have? He said, about a month and then I'm going back. Well, after the initial shock of hearing his certainty about what he wanted to do and his belief that with the help of others, he could make it happen, I got on board. Long story short, the paperwork was filed for a nonprofit status as a 501c3 in the state of California. An inaugural jazz and wine silent auction was held at the Palm Court Hotel here in Davis. Some of you in this congregation were there. That brought in right around $10,000. Max's naivete and youth at the time seemed to free him from perceiving obstacles that might have blocked his vision of helping these kids. In contrast, my older and crustier midlife vantage point was full of reasons why something like building this school wouldn't work. But I was hooked. I was hooked by his conviction that this was the right thing to do. He had stumbled upon these kids and knew that they were lacking education and hope, and he could not not know it now. He has a good heart, damn. 2007 turns into 2021, <clears throat> and Myanmar Children's Foundation has built a beloved community of like minds who volunteer, donate, serve on the board, and travel to Myanmar. Together with supporters in this church, we have fundraised over $200,000, built 15 schools, water tanks, latrines, dormitories, and libraries. We've supported teacher trainings and medical clinics, women's weaving groups, and pediatric hospitals. We've worked with Buddhist monks and nuns, Christian schools, government schools, colleges, the British Council and American Center. We've seen the country move out of military control into the light of a decade of hope with good governance and now back into a military takeover. We've seen cyclones and tsunamis, dengue fever, tuberculosis, and now COVID. The needs are still there. 
So after opening up my inner compass for inspection in the daylight, I find many things in, in, in it. My parents' love, my ancestors' striving, my son's good heart, inspired teachings from prophets, deep grief and losses, various churches, especially this one with pastors Joy, Jay, Beth, and Morgan, and countless loving friends, teachers, and students. So, yes, my UU faith tradition of over 40 years has played a role in my charity work in Myanmar. It has quietly underlain my everyday orientation towards action and compassion in the world. It has taught me about smooth stones and jagged rocks, how to honor our earth, and how to build a beloved community that works to create a positive future for all, regardless of religion, language, politics, race, or geography. In our living tradition, we have been inspired, challenged, and expanded by the scholarly and spiritual work of our UU theologians. This is just as true today as it ever has been. As always, our leading theologians are professors at theological schools. There are also theologians who are ministers or lay leaders who are deeply engaged in the practice of Unitarian Universalism in the world. They are people who study, debate, reflect, and invite others to do the same. When you read the latest articles in the UU World magazine, or get updates from the Side of Love campaign, or follow a study guide in a common read, you are engaging with our current theologians. This is how our faith moves forward with the changing world, and how it helps guide those changes. In the last decade, professional religious leaders started by the Reverend Nancy Bowen in the UU Mountain Desert District were reflecting on James Luther Adams' smooth stones, and they found a way to reframe them, to invite additional reflection grounded in the seven principles and six sources as we define them today. Instead of smooth stones, they called them jagged rocks in recognition that we as individuals and as a faith are not perfect. We are human. We make mistakes. We are always learning. We challenge ourselves and the fractured social systems we live in. Our spiritual journeys and our work in the world are not necessarily smooth using caution as we reach for something to hold on to reminds us to be intentional and courageous as we deepen our relationship with Unitarian Universalism. These jagged rocks give us more theological grounding. They are articulated this way. There is a unity that makes us one. All souls are sacred and worthy. Courageous love transforms the world. Salvation is in this life. Truth continues to be revealed to us. Let's look at each of these jagged rocks. And as we do, I invite you to consider what speaks to you the most. What do you hold on to for your theological grounding? That first statement, although these statements can be in any order, there's no priority. There is a unity that makes us one. You use believe that we exist in an interdependent web of existence. 
We humans, along with all living organisms, are part of a larger whole. We know that we are part of something greater than our individual selves. Some of us call that something greater God. Others call it love or spirit of life or the expanding universe, and still others struggle to name it. We can feel this unity in many ways. We can feel it when we are watching the calming waves or when we feel restored after a hike when we pause at the beauty of nature as Susan so beautifully did this morning with us, or when we watch the bees busily pollinate. We can feel this unity when we are inspired by a piece of music or feel a connection to an author that we've never met. When we feel a connection to strangers at a justice march, that is the unity that makes us one. That's the spirit of life. That's God, a connection beyond ourselves, a unity that makes us one. Another jagged rock, all souls are sacred and worthy. This comes probably from our universalist heritage, a belief that an all loving God would never damn a soul for eternity. And if such a loving God loves unconditionally in the afterlife, then we on earth can love unconditionally in this life. Today, you'll see many UU churches named all souls. And you'll know that our first principle is affirming the inherent worth and dignity of every person. Unconditional love like this is a radical idea. It's a vision of a world built with equal admiration of each person's unique gifts. And a world that truly cares for those gifts must ensure the freedom and security and opportunity for all of humankind. All souls are created sacred and worthy. The next jagged rock, courageous love transforms the world. What is courageous love? It's the kind of love that we sing about when answering the call of love in our yellow shirts in a march for justice. It's how we search for deeper connection in our communities and the world, believing there is more love somewhere. It is knowing in our bones that love will guide us through the hard night and not giving up on our quest for truth and meaning. It is believing that we can in fact change the world with our love. It takes courage to believe in this kind of love because we must make ourselves vulnerable to the difficult realities of the world we live in and never lose hope. Courageous love transforms the world. Another jagged rock, salvation in this life. We have over 200 years of tradition that has emphasized the life we are living now over concerns about what happens after we die. We find salvation by living a moral and just life. We find salvation in our work for justice and equity because we know that until we are all free, none of us are free. Unitarian Universalists have been on the front lines of finding salvation in this life for hundreds of years. We worked hard for the abolition of slavery and the rights of women. We marched for civil rights and embraced our LGBT siblings. 
We have worked for immigration justice and provided sanctuary to asylum seekers and refugees. We have to live into our highest ideals. That is salvation in this life. And a fifth jagged rock, truth continues to be revealed. Our religious tradition is a living tradition because we are always discovering new truths. A core of our faith is our willingness to examine our individual lives and to never stop learning or growing. When we look at the sources that we draw from, we find that there are many ways that we find truth and many ways that we keep expanding our understanding of the world around us. We are inspired by personal experiences, words and deeds of prophetic people, teachings from the world's religions, reason and science, and the spirituality that celebrates the rhythms of nature. Truth continues to be revealed. The smooth stones and the jagged rocks give us more ways to articulate our UU theology. They tell us that we are part of a rich history and a vibrant living tradition that is always learning and growing. Our faith is about making this life meaningful and helping others to thrive. Unitarian Universalism recognizes a radical love that we know can transform the world. We know that people are inherently worthy of that love. We believe there is something larger than our individual selves, and we celebrate the many ways the people in our congregations define that. Learning, love, justice, mutuality, hope. We have so much to give this world. It is wonderful to be together, to share our lives and our exploration. As we come to the end of our service, I extinguish the candles of sorrow and joy. May our sorrows be lessened by being held here. And may our joys shine brighter because they have been shared among us. And may what we found here today, the truth and support for our lives go with us until we meet again next week. Susan is extinguishing her chalice flame you're invited to extinguish your chalice flame, knowing that that light goes on in each of us until we come back together. Our closing words are from 21st century UU theologian, Tandeika. Hear your commission to love, to create community and to heal one at a time in personal relationships, 10 at a time in covenant groups, hundreds at a time in our congregations, hundreds of thousands at a time in our religious movement. Millions at a time as we take our commission deeper and deeper into humanity's heart as a justice loving people who will transform the world. And let this congregation say, Amen. Amen. Amen.